Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for the Homegrown Shorts Q&A. My name is Laura Good, and I'm a programmer here at the Canadian Film Fest. I'm so thrilled to announce that we have the filmmakers for five of the brilliant shorts from our Homegrown Shorts package number two here with us today to chat about their films. So welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you could each maybe start off by introducing uh, yourself and telling us what was the genesis of the inspiration behind your film? What was the moment you decided you had to make it? Um, and give us a little insight into that push. Uh, do you wanna start us off? I'm just going around uh, clockwise on my screen. Um, Marlo. For White Rose. Yes, it's uh, Marilou, Marilou. Marilou, excuse yeah, me. Yeah, no worries. Um, so White Rose was in inspired by uh, my grandmother's funerals uh, that happened in 2017. So that was the genesis of the movie. And then I wrote it for like four years um, because at first the, the, the it, it was, I, I wanted to, to change the, the perspective on it because uh, at first I wrote it, it was my perspective, but then I, I changed it to be my cousin's perspective because it's a family story. Um, so it took me a long time to, to, to write it, to, to change it and to, to move it more towards a um, mother-daughter relationship, less than a family story. So, so yeah, it was inspired by my grandmother's funeral. Thank you for that. And next clockwise, if we could hear from Araya and Khadija, who are the two directors of Defund. Uh, hi, thank you so much for having us, Laura. Um, the film uh, was a true to life um, documentation of the day to day that we were living at the height of the Black Lives Matter movement and the first wave of the pandemic in the summer of 2020. Um, we were both feeling a whole lot of feelings about what it is that we were reading about on the news and witnessing on social media. So the film was our response to that, our decision to articulate what it, what it was that we were feeling about what we were witnessing. Mm -hmm. And you, you were able to do that by way of um, an offer. So after um, just like post George Floyd and as the BLM um, uprisings were starting to happen and there was all this activity, uh, Khadija actually received a message from Jay Stevens, who's our DP and editor and co-producer um, on Defund, who basically offered from Calgary their skill set um, as a DP and editor and their equipment uh, and said to Khadija, you want to make something? Let's let's make something. And then Khadija turned to me and was like, We're right over here. <laughs> we've been roommates for the last five years. And uh, and I just kind of shot a little thing uh, and asked if we want to do something and, and defund was born. Thank you so much. And Kennedy, uh, I would say that your film appears to have been inspired by social justice movement as well. Did you want to Tell us a little bit about what inspired you to make We Don't Need Your Kind. Sure thing. Um, yeah, basically basically the same thing, right? Just being in lockdown and uh, seeing a lot of the anti-Asian hate crimes uh, being circulated on social media and on the news and just not quite knowing how I felt about it, if that makes sense. There was just a, a multitude of emotions that I was feeling, you know, obviously anger and sadness, some loneliness as well. And I think film for me is um, a way to articulate emotions that I just can't um, understand. And so I decided to make a, a film about, uh, I guess, how, how I was feeling at that time. And um, and uh, and yeah, so it's very similar for sure to, to, to the defund team, um, just being inspired by this, by this, uh, by this movement that was that was being uh, circulated. Thank you, Sandra. Could we hear from you as to the inspiration behind Trophy? Yes. Um, 
Well, Trophy uh, started with the desire to talk about a complicated relationship between uh, a father and his daughter. Um, uh, I had a complicated relationship with my father, so I felt like I wanted to, you know, tell a story about that, but I wanted to bring it a bit further. And so uh, I played hockey for, for many years, uh, and I read this article about uh, a hockey player named Patrick uh, pa Patrick O'Sullivan, and um, and he told his story about you know uh, violence, uh, his complicated relation with his father, and I felt like yeah, why not bring these two uh, universe together? And so um, because for me, hockey has always been like uh, something fun and where I can you know. Um, stop thinking about you know problems in my life so I felt yeah maybe you know I can put all these things together and so yeah it was this idea also of telling a story of empowerment as well of this young girl who wants to free um, herself from her father yeah thank you for that and next uh, Matthias could you speak a little bit about the inspiration behind Bleach of course um well, Bleach was inspired by a friend's story uh, who shared with me some of the terrible things their coach, uh, the experience with their coach and how it changed their life. And we talked about making some kind of project about it for a number of years. And eventually I was like, I, you know what, maybe I'm not the one to tell this story. And when I told them that, they were like, oh, well, that's disappointing. So I felt like, OK, I got to I got to do something um, and speak to this truth at some point. And in Quebec, Sodec runs this program called Cool Coats on Cool Race to Write Your Short, which I submitted to, um, I participated in. One of the mentors there was actually Nicolas Griff, who's also in this program, but isn't here today. And uh, yeah, I developed the script, met my producer, Emmanuel Hessler, who isn't here today, but it, uh, yeah, it, it set us off on the route to production, so. Thank you. And I love that you uh, talked about authorship and the way that you considered and weighed whether you were the right person to tell that story. Because I think that's something that these five films in particular um, just have such di distinct directorial voices. And to us as a programming team just felt that that came through in this perfect marriage of creators and stories and just being the right voice to tell this story. And they all clearly come from a very personal and emotionally loaded place. And I think that's something that's why they're all so powerful and so effective. Um, and another commonality I sort of see in this thread of this group of filmmakers is trauma. Uh, all of these films deal with trauma. And um, I was wondering if you could each speak to the, the trauma inherent to your film or your topic and art as an agent of healing and or change and uh, what you hope came through from your work in that regard. And do you wanna start us off again, uh, Marhilu? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I think there's something really beautiful and complicated for me about the, the mother-daughter relationship so I think there's something I wanted to say about, about it and something maybe healing, like, like you say. So the idea, the idea was to talk about the, the fact that sometimes when you grow up, you, you grow to, to realize that your parents are not only just your parents, they're also humans with their own flaws. So that was the idea with, with the movie to, to end with some kind of idea of something beautiful, but also still complicated and, and really hard to, to feel. So there's something also with the funerals, something really beautiful and weird and, and hard about it. And also that's why it takes place during winter, because I think there's something, again, with winter that's that's beautiful and really harsh with the cold, the wind, but also with the beautiful landscapes. So, yeah. Thank you for that. And can we go down to the defund team? Um, I guess I've, I would say that for myself, the, 
I think there were a couple of times that I referred to the film uh, as a trauma response. Um, I know uh, as a black woman, I find that my art artistry is often how I um, articulate whatever it is that I'm feeling that, <laughs> you know, I think that what we've been seeing in the news over the last two years um, is just a fragment of what Black people know to be true about the world. Um, so this film being made at the time that it was made was, to put it simply, an opportunity to, to speak to the trauma that is constant in uh, Black people's lives. Yeah, and um, I think for me, the this kind of like exploration of the pandemic sort of creating a backdrop by which, and at least in our film, the characters are are fearful of the world and like in a, in a way that's now twofold. <laughs> Um, there's the, the the real threat of the pandemic, and then there's also the very real threat of what this like what the society holds for people that like hold bodies uh, such as us. Um, and so like that's the sort of that's the central issue for these two people is how do you engage and be a part of a change of some kind when when stepping outside of your doors is dangerous for you. Um, we like we, we attach like a humorous <laughs> lens to 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 these questions and um, and I think that being able to engage with it from a perspective that isn't this conversation from a perspective that isn't you get pulled over and now it's the police interaction with folks but from people that are not in a situation where they're directly being approached by law enforcement but are still subject to the the very real threat of what the possibility of that could be for them uh, and for people that they know or love or anywhere in their community um, was something that was really interesting to us and is a part of our experience. So this offered us an opportunity to maybe approach the conversation from a different angle. And, um, and yeah, I mean, just doing the work itself and having it exist has been something that has been helpful for, I think, both of us to Absolutely. be able to express and helpful for everyone seeing it i think as well it's, you know everyone in this program is affecting transformation just through sharing their work on every person who views it and that's the trans for me as a programmer i like to think that's a transformative power of film uh, so thank you for your work kennedy did you want to um kind of expand on within your film how it's informed by trauma and how you see film as an agent of healing or change, if you do. Yeah, I, I mean, I think my, my film speaks about how social media is a tool to help deal with trauma. Um, because obviously social media is such a powerful form of communication nowadays. And with social media, you're able to share an experience with um, with, um, with everyone around you who might be able to relate to it or even use it as a, um, or even use it to spark some sort of meaningful discussion. And that's something that when I was in lockdown and witnessing these, um, you know, these anti-Asian hate crimes um, being, uh, being circulated on, on the news, it just, it made me think about possibly using my social media platform to help promote the cause or, or help um, spark some sort of uh, discussion, uh, you know, involving involving these these uh, these hate crimes, and um, yeah. So in, in terms of um, uh, sparking some sort of action. To, to help deal with, with trauma. I think nowadays social media is such an important tool for, for, for all of us, right? And, um, and so, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, definitely. And I would argue that your film itself is an extension of that, an amplification of that. Mm -hmm. Just to weigh in. And Sandra, could you speak a little bit about trophy uh, and the role of, of trauma and your work itself as an agent of healing and or change? Yes, um, well, 
I do think that film can be agent of change. I hope so, <laughs> actually. Um, for sure, for me, um, I felt that if I wrote a story um, that you know talks about this complicated relationship between a father and his daughter, I felt like it could be healing for me, even if I did not you know live exactly the same thing as my characters. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I felt like at one point in my career, I needed to write something like that. Um, and also I feel like it's universal, universal. So I think other people can relate to it, maybe uh, reflect on that as well. And I felt that uh, also talking about this female hockey player, this young female hockey player was something important to me as well, because um, I think we're in a state or a time where we want to hear like female stories as well. And I felt that hockey is something that we relate to boys most of the time. So I felt like, why not, you know, uh, having this female character, you know, um, being good at hockey and being something important in her life. And um, yeah, so I felt like uh, I wanted to talk about that and that sports can be important in our lives. And you know, shed a light uh, on, you know, female hockey, as well as this relationship between a father and his daughter. And also about like how there is so much child abuse in sports as well. So has Kennedy, I wanted to really spark discussion as well on that subject. So yeah, I hope that it can be, um, yeah, an agent of change, hopefully. I'm really glad discussion. you... Yeah, absolutely. I'm really glad you mentioned gender because that's something that stood out to our team as well was the fact that your film is told from a female perspective. And that is something that we hadn't seen is that sort of dynamic of the toxic um, hockey parent and overbearing, overachieving father being directed toward a female athlete. And then similarly, moving up to um, Matias with Bleach, sorry to sort of pivot on you a little bit, but another thing that we found really interesting about your film Bleach is that it deals with sexual abuse from a male lens, which we don't often see also. And so I was wondering if you could speak to that in the context of trauma and also what you'd ho hope to bring about in terms of healing or change, if that was your aim with the film. Um, yeah, well, I, I guess to take a gendered lens to look at it that way. Um, with Bleach, the, this, in the story of Bleach, the traumatic event has already happened. The dramatic question is for this young character, what does he do now? And uh, to kind of build on some of the things Sandra was talking about with sport, there's not so many options if you wanna continue doing what you're doing or continue this relationship with your coach. And um, I wanna make a film that explored that conflict, but also offered some kind of answer for young boys or uh, young men, I should say. And so that's where uh, we haven't seen the film yet, but the, the younger brother character and the kind of possibility that comes through vulnerability and, and intimacy between young men and boys, I, I think is uh, really important because it's, it's pretty antithetical to the kind of, um, keep it all in, like keep fighting mentality that we're taught. So uh, we took that approach from the beginning. We talked to a sensitivity reader early on. Um, I was curious, like how much can we talk about this stuff that like, we don't want to cause harm here? And they said something that really stuck with me, which is, well, if you're, if someone comes in and, and, and sees and feels something that is truthful to their, to their experience, that can be healing as long as it's contained and as long as um, it's not exploitative. So with, with that kind of, yeah, that, that, that was the approach uh, is that like someone in the situation is uh, probably not in a position to talk about it and um, we want to make something that would uh, speak to their truth. Thank you so much for that. Um, I also wanted to ask you each a little bit about your casting because you all have remarkable actors bringing these stories to life, some of which are really uh, walking a really tough line. Um, I know that uh, a, a few of you sort of touched on like the tonal dualities in your films, like Araya and Khadija mentioned that Define manages to be a dark comedy in some beats, as well as being like a skating critique and a drama, of course. Um, and we've got 
that going on in a lot of the films I think here where there's there are some really demanding roles that have some some a lot of nuance like in the case of, of Bleach and White Rose and Trophy as well and then um, so, some really tight turns in tone also in um, We Don't Need Your Kind which also has this largely non-verbal performance throughout the uh, first two thirds of the film, which then makes when she speaks so powerful. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, if you could speak as the director to the casting process and how you evoked the performances from your actors that you did. And so this will probably be our, our last time around, um, but if you could start us off again, Marhilu. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I met uh, Alain Winant, the, the, the main character, um, four years ago when I started writing uh, this, uh, this script. And uh, it's Elise Bois, my, my producer, that uh, she talked to me about that, that, that girl. And uh, so I went, um, I took, a, I took a, a coffee with her and um, we finally spoke for, for three hours about... Um, her mother and family and everything, so it clicked in instantly, and she's she sticks to she's she stick to the the project till the end, and um, for me it was it was really hard to to find the perfect mother for her because I wanted the uh, the age gap to to fit, and uh, so we we search we. We also it, we we didn't have a lot of money also to to shoot this movie, so it was also a, a, a money issue sometimes. So uh, we finally uh, found Marilyn Thibault. I think like um, three weeks before the the, the shooting, and um, it 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 also clicked instantly. And what's funny about it is is that um, she kind of looks like my mother, so. It, it, it wasn't um, something I, I wanted, but when I, I watched the, the footing, I was like, this is my mother. So that's, that's kind of funny and yeah, so, so it, it worked. And we, for the approach, um, I took a lot of coffees with Alien to talk about the, the character, the way that uh, I, I wanted to, to, um, to add some nuances to, to her character and everything. And the fact that I wanted her to keep everything uh, inside, but also be kind of uh, provocative with her mother. So uh, we had a lot of um, uh, rehearsals together. And because on the, we had only three days uh, of, sh of shoot. So I wanted everything to be perfect before because I knew on set we wouldn't have a lot of time so um so yeah and also together Alien and Marilyn was a perfect match they they were kind of friends or kind of mother daughter so yeah that's it Good chemistry yeah thank you and then Araya and Khadija could you talk about the casting and defunds <laughs> <laughs> wide, wide casting search for oh our leads. Oh my gosh, oh, wow. took, took us forever. forever. <laughs> and we're we, like, we'll just do it, I guess. <laughs> we, we've we been roommates for five years. And so we've done a ton of self-taping together. Mm -hmm. So when we wrote the script for this film, like we, we, we wrote for one another. We wrote scenes and dialogue knowing that the other person would be speaking those lines. Uh, and that was really, I think that hilariously informed the writing. Um, and when it came to casting around our two characters, uh, I am guilty of just wanting to work with the people that I know and adore. So every other person, every other actor in the cast is someone that either one of us has worked with before and genuinely admire. We, I, I'm so... Which just happens to be, they're also our friends. Exactly, so like, yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, we made this thing in the height of the pandemic and most of these other people are appearing on phones and as voices, mm -hmm. if not, if I think only one or two other people actually are two in, people person in person yeah. actors yeah. That, uh, that appear with us. 
And uh, yeah, it, it, it's the casting process as with the rest of the creative team is really something that has happened very, very, very organically. Mm -hmm. Wherever we needed something like a, a spot filled, there was always somebody that just happened to appear. It was like, oh yeah, I'm doing something completely unrelated to this, but I can do that too, sure. <laughs> I'll do that. Um, and then we would just have that. <laughs> yeah. So everybody really fits the mold of what is asked of them. Because, you know, when you get to when you write something, surprise, surprise, you can mold it to be whatever you want. And we made sure that it fit each and more each, each and every one of their voices. Like the um, there's one character in the in the short film. Um, I don't want to give too much away, but that role was initially written for one actor who ended up not being available for the shoot dates. Um, and so we asked another actor, we asked Anand Rajaram to step in and it's, it's phenomenal how, just how different the character exists now compared to when we init initially wrote it for, and that with another actor in mind, but it's, it's still, it's still exactly what we needed the character to be. And the choices that Anand made are, were so unique and I'm forever thankful for them. <laughs> awesome. And I have to say the cadence and power and chemistry of your performances are so pitch perfect. It's not shocking at all to me to hear that you wrote them for one another and so closely collaborated because I couldn't imagine it, had I not known you were the co-directors, uh, that those were just two actors that were cast to have such incredible chemistry. Thank you. <laughs> Kennedy, do you want to jump in and speak a little bit about casting your lead or your, your project? Yeah, for sure. So uh, Lena Nguyen plays the character of Sarah, and I'm actually really good friends with Lena. I'd worked on a project with her before this film, and so we already knew each other well. And I wrote the role with her in mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, similar to uh, Mary Lou, we just had a lot of meetups, have, had, had a lot of video chats, just discussing the character, discussing the backstory of this character, um, uh, th just the context behind her, her decisions in the, in the film, uh, just, to, just to bring that nuance to, to her character. Um, I think the biggest challenge for Lena during during the shooting was to what you were saying, Laura, just being so still for two thirds of the film, basically having no dialogue. Um, because usually for actors, they need some sort of warm up to get to a kind of big monologue, which is at the end of this film. And for her, she basically just had to be present in in her moment in her space for the majority of the shooting and so I think she did a, she did a fantastic job doing that and I think uh, her I guess her performance at the end her, her final monologue at the end uh, really really was just impressive to me just be able being able to to encapsulate all these emotions that that the character was feeling in one scene Right, like that was really, really, really powerful to to see, um, and um, and yeah, she did a she did a great job. Thank you. And Sandra, could you walk us through your casting? Your lead and uh, your antagonist are so incredibly powerful in this film. Could you tell us about that process a little bit? Yeah. Well. Um... For my main character, uh, Dominique, uh, this young uh, female hockey player, I really wanted to find a real <laughs> hockey player, like someone who played from a young age, because um, I, I really wanted to, to bring, you know, authenticity to the film. And so I went through, a, yeah, a long casting as well. Um, uh, I had to meet like with you know, hockey teams um, around the area. And uh, I, you know, kind of interviewed a few girls. Um, and then um, I found Anael um, and she was just um, amazing. Her eyes, um, maybe like Kennedy as well, like she doesn't have to say much and you feel something. So I felt that 
that was perfect for my character because she doesn't say much, she doesn't speak much until, yeah, the ends of the film where she confronts um, a little bit her father. And, uh, and so, yeah, so I had to do some coaching because it was her first uh, experience as uh, an actress, um, but she was really willing to, you know, um, dive into this new universe. And uh, so we did some coaching and then I felt like I needed to find um, you know, professional actors uh, to play her father and mother. And uh, her father, he played uh, so many roles here in Quebec. Uh, he's experienced, he's done some theater work as well. And he's played quite often like antagonists, like, and I felt like he could do that and, and bring also nuances to the project. Um, and it was really interesting because they also gave me, you know, their point of views as well about you know, some scenes. So we worked, you know, around dialogues and we even changed, I even changed a little bit the ending while discussing with them. And, uh, and so I did some rehearsal as well. So she, you know, so Dominique um, Anael actually could meet um, the actors before, you know, being on set. So there was a lot of coaching to make sure that when she arrives, you know, on set, she, she knows a little bit what it's like, even if she's never lived it <laughs> before. So yeah, that's, that's mainly how we worked. And we tried to give, the, give us as much time as possible on set to you know, reshoot if we had to, so she can feel comfortable with her performance and me as well and the other actors. So we tried to give us as much space as possible with you know, acting and yeah, so it was much fun. And I think she enjoyed it <laughs> a lot. Thanks for that. We do have to jump up to Matthias, but I just wanted to quickly say, it's also such an incredible supporting performance from the father to see that duality that is so often inherent to abusers that are so charming, charismatic outwardly, and then just so monstrous um, in a domestic situation. And I thought that was really deftly directed. Um, Matthias, could you speak a little bit about your casting and also what it was like to work with a child actor? Of course. Um, well, first of all, Ryan Hill, yeah, who, who plays um, the younger brother is such a capable actor and such a sweetheart. <laughs> so it was like, it was a really obvious choice and uh, he's a pro, he works on, on stuff all the time. So it, it was actually the opposite of some like working with less experienced uh, kids where you're like, okay, we need to complement him with, with someone who, um, like brings this kind of like naturalism to a role and together I think we can get something really interesting. So that's where Jacob, Jacob White Duck Lavoie came in. Um, we had known him and his performance through Une Colonie, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, this feature film in Quebec. And uh, he was like the number one for a while. Uh, but once we got the funding, we went through a full casting process just to make sure. And because we were trying to answer the question that uh, Sandra went, went through as well, like, huh, like, do we, like, should we get a swimmer or should we get an actor and like learn how to swim? Like it would, you're exploring all possibilities and it, it quickly became apparent, like, A, we, we don't have that much swimming, um, but B, like, there's just so much interiority to the role, so much that needs to be said with the look or um, a quiver and, uh, Jacob was just so game from it from the very beginning. So it was a real pleasure to work together, but we had to do some swim coaching, which was fun in a pandemic as well. Um, when pools close and yeah, there's so many, so many obstacles, but um, yeah, I, we ended up getting uh, through our casting search met like other swim teams uh, who were also really eager to get in the pool because they hadn't swam uh, during the pandemic for a while. So uh, we had a bunch of really, really enthusiastic, energetic teenagers who could swim so fast and kind of work with them to merge them together and con uh, convince the audience that like Jacob was a swimmer as well. And I mean, I'll let you guys all decide if we succeeded, but yeah, it was a fun balance. And then Lyndon Bray, who plays the, the coach, we'd worked together in my previous short film, Gas Can. So it was a bit of Saskatchewan thrown in there as well. Definitely. Well, I think I can speak for all of us at Canadian Film Fest and for our audiences by saying it most certainly was a success. This is such a powerful program and we're so honored to be presenting all of these films. So we do have to jump off, but I just want to say thank you so much 
once again to each and every one of you for trusting us to present your brilliant work. I think this program is really emotionally loaded and really runs the spectrum of human emotion and is very much of our time. And um, so I'm really proud of all of this work assembled here together. And uh, thank you so much to all of our audiences who tuned in and joined us today. And with that, we'll sign off. Thanks, guys. Sit back, relax when it's the greatest. Hey, don't get back.